Well, I want to welcome you to the live web presentation tonight um, featuring Dr. Tom Lentz. Um, this is given by My Horse University and HorseQuest through the extension. And tonight, um, Dr. Lentz is going to talk about the Unwanted Horse Coalition. Dr. Lentz has had a 30-year veterinarian career. He has worked in private equine practice, academia, and corporate business. He's a graduate of the University of Missouri College of Vet Med. He also um, received his master's degree in equine reproduction from Texas A&M. He is active in the equine industry and is a past president of the American Association of Equine Practitioners. He is currently a member of the American Horse Council's Horse Welfare Committee, the Research Committee of the American Quarter Horse Association, and the Veterinarian Association advisory board of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. He is uh, the chair of AAEP's Welfare Committee, the American Horse Council's Unwanted Horse Coalition, and a member of AAEP's President, Advisor Board, and Public Policy Committee. He writes a monthly horse health column for the Quarter Horse Journal as well. Well, let's welcome Dr. Lentz, and I will hand it over. Thanks, Shady. Thanks, Kate. So we'll get started, and uh, if you have a question while we're going along here, we will uh, we'll try to entertain those. So just type them in. If they're not too many, if they're too many, of them, we may have to wait till the end of the presentation. Does everybody hear me? Okay. Yep, looks like it. Okay. So what started the unwanted horse discussion was back in 2001, uh, there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Europe, which caused an increased demand for horse meat in Europe and drew the attention of the American media. And they wondered, I wonder if we eat horses in this country. And so they looked into the, and they found out that we in fact don't eat horses, but we do in fact process horses for meat. And then meat is shipped to Europe for people to consume in, in Europe. When they started publishing their findings, it fostered the realization by the horse industry that there was indeed an unwanted horse because these horses exemplify that and we'll talk about them quite a bit throughout this talk. It also stimulated a lot of federal legislation that was aimed at preventing horse slaughter because a lot of the humane groups, some of the horse groups, thought that we should not be eating horse meat. And uh, and so it started a discussion. I'm sure most of you are well aware of that discussion has taken place in the horse industry for the last six or seven years. The, fir the, the definition, the best definition of the unwanted horse, and this is a, the term unwanted horse is a relatively new term because we coined it back in 2005 when the Unwanted Horse Coalition was formed. And what we define as an unwanted horse is a horse that's no longer wanted by their current owner because they're old, injured, sick, unmanageable, and fail to meet their owner's expectations. And fail to meet their owner's expectations may be the number one reason that horses become unwanted. Generally, these are horses that have non-life-threatening disabilities or problems because if they did have a life-threatening problem, they'd probably be euthanized or die. So the horses that have behavioral problems, they're horses that are dangerous and can't be handled. They're unadopted, uh, unadoptable feral horses, and we'll talk about the feral horses here in a little bit too. They're old horses, horses that fail to meet their expectations of their owners because they're not pretty enough, they're not athletic enough, they don't run fast enough, they can't sell them, or they're the wrong color. And today we have to add into that with the increased price of diesel fuel and the price of hay and grain. A lot of people that thought that horses cost a certain amount of money to own and, and, and to ride and to use cost much, much more uh, because of the high price of grain and, and diesel fuel. And so they are no longer meeting their owner's expectations. And a lot of those horses are being dumped on the market today. And then also, if you were to look at a pen of these horses, and I've been to the processing plants and I've been to the uh, corrals on the Mexican border where these horses are being exported into Mexico, you can see the old horses and you can see the triple horses and you can see the horses that have issues. But most of the horses, if you just stand and look out at a corral, most of these just look like normal horses that you would have at your own home or look like the horses that are in my pasture. 
Some of the things that we didn't know when we started this discussion, we didn't know what breeds were represented. If we talked to the quarter horse people, they said this is a racehorse issue, and they're prim primarily thoroughbreds. If we talked to the thoroughbred people, this is a western horse issue. It's caused by overbreeding the quarter horse industry. And everybody was pointing at each other, but really no one really knew. Is there a specific sex that becomes unwanted? And again, we're going we're gonna to focus the early part of this discussion on the horses that go to slaughter because they are ultimately the most unwanted horses in this country. According to a, a survey that was run in Colorado a few years ago, the average horse in the state of Colorado is worth around $3,000. I talked to the boys at uh, American Quarter Horse Association last week, and they told me the average quarter horse that was sold in the United States last year brought $6,800. Well, the horses that are going to processing plants are selling for around $120, $150, $180 if they're in good flesh. And so it's obvious that these horses are being, are being discarded and thrown away. And so that's why we'll talk about them, because they, uh, they exemplify the unwanted horse. We didn't know how many were purebred versus grade, and we still don't. We didn't know what their most recent occupation was, what their value is. We know what people are paying for them, but that doesn't mean that's what their value is or what happens to all of them. Of course, we know what happens to some of them. And so here's some information we got from USDA from 2001 to 2005. Horses that were processed in the United States for meat at slaughter plants. And, and you have to be aware that prior to 2001, nobody was really keeping track. And so when we would ask, no one had a clue. But, but when the issue came up and, and the focus of the horse industry turned toward it, they started counting. And so here's what they find. They found that about 70% of the horses that are processed over the last four or five years were western type horses. They're not necessarily quarter horses, but they're a western type horse. About 5 to 6 percent are thoroughbred type, but again, those could be warm blood. They could be tall, thin horses of any breed. And then there's a number of horses that they couldn't specify the breed. There were some draft horses and a few Mustangs. You need to know that about 65 percent of the horses in this country are registered quarter horses. And so it doesn't take much imagination to realize that about 70% of the horses in this country are probably western type horses. And so that pretty much represents what we're seeing here. About 10 to 11% of the horses in the United States are thoroughbreds. And so in, in this study it showed that 5 to 6% were going to processing plants. So that roughly reflects. And so I think the bottom line here is that there's no specific breed, there's no specific type. This is just a cross-section of the horse industry in America. When you look at sex or gender, about 60% of them are mares, the rest are gildings or stallions. And again, you know, through the years, half of the horses that are born are stallions and half are mares. So this is pretty much what you would expect. And again, that represents the, the cross-section of horses in the U.S. So how many horses are there? And that's really hard to tell because we do know that in the year 2007, and, and when we go through this, you'll see some discrepancy in some of our figures because based on the source, you get different numbers. And if I contact USDA, which I talk to them today, they'll give you different numbers depending on who you talk to because, again, we haven't been keeping track, so some of our estimates, but the last couple of years were pretty accurate. And so in 2007, we know that about 58,000 horses were processed for meat in the United States. They're unwanted. 35,000 were shipped across the border to Canada for processing. They're unwanted. 45,000 were exported to Mexico. 21,000 horses are in unadoptable wild horse uh, sanctuaries that are maintained by the Bureau of Land Management. If a horse is over the age of nine, a, a captured feral or wild horse, a Mustang, is over the age of nine, or if they're put up for adoption three times and not adopted, those horses are transported to ranches or feedlots, dry lots, in Kansas, Oklahoma, and, and two or three other places in the country. And the federal government pays those people to, pay, to feed those horses until they die of old age. 
and these horses will live on average 25 to 30 years nowadays. And so the government spends about $22 million a year feeding their, those horses. We know there's about 29,000 wild horses still uh, in the wild. Each year the BLM captures around 9,000 head, um, or around, uh, yeah, around 9,000. They put them into the adoption pipeline and they usually adopt five or 6,000 out. So there's three or 4,000 a year that are not being adopted that go into this 21,000. So over time that gradually increases. And then what we don't know is we don't know how many horses are abandoned, neglected, abused, or just left to fend for themselves out in the pasture. But we do know based on these figures, there are at least 170,000 unwanted horses each year. Now currently these horses that are processed for meat are removed from that population, but they're replaced by roughly that amount uh, every year, and we'll show you that here in a chart. So this chart shows you the number of horses processed in U.S. plants from 1990 to 2007. Back in the 1990s, the U.S. was processing a little over 300,000 horses each year. That seems like a lot, but in the, in the world meat market for horses, there are about 2.5 million horses processed worldwide. China processes over half of those, and around 600,000 a year are processed in Mexico. The thing about the, pro the meat business in the United States is it's not driven by the price of meat or the demand, it's driven by the, the availability of cheap, inexpensive horses. And so over time that has decreased and fairly flattened out, except for the last two or three years it's starting to gradually go up. In 2007 you'll see there's a decrease, but that decrease reflects the processing plants were closed and those horses were no longer processed in this country. So why the decrease? And one of the arguments or one of the discussion points you will hear from uh, some of the humane groups is that there really is not an unwanted horse issue, that we were able to absorb all of those horses, and that's why the number decreased back here from a high of 300,000 down to a low of, of somewhere around 40,000. They will argue that this decrease occurred because the uh, horse industry was able to absorb those horses. Well, there's several reasons why that might have occurred. One is that there was a change in the IRS tax code in the, in the mid to late 1980s. It used to be that if you had horses, you could write them off and nobody paid much attention. But in the mid-80s, they changed the tax code, and you had to be in a bona fide horse business that showed a profit uh, periodically, and that was your primary focus or one of your primary focuses. And so in my practice in those days, I had a lot of saddlebreds and a lot of Arabs that were owned by dentists and doctors that really weren't too uh, interested in the horse industry, but they were great tax write-offs, and so they maintained a herd of these horses. When that happened, these people sold their horses out. In my part of the country, I live near Kansas City, the Arabian horse almost became extinct because so many of them were sold off. Now they've rebounded since then, but there was really a decrease in their numbers in those states. The question, was there a changing market demand? Was there a decrease in production? Was there a surplus reduction because they were processed for meat? Or did they find alternative careers, rescue facilities, or retirement facilities that could take all these horses in, and therefore there are not as many unwanted horses? This chart here shows the, uh, the uh, let's see if I can find my pointer. Here it is. This chart right here shows the horse registration numbers from 1960 up to 2003, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll see that in the mid-80s, they pretty much peaked out and then they declined. And, and I, I feel very strongly, and so do a lot of people, that that decline was because they could no longer write these horses off, and so they started getting rid of them. And then when that surplus reduction occurred and these horses were removed from the population, and then they started to grow the industry. The only one that wasn't affected by this was the paint horse, but the paint horse association was not a big breed association back in the 60s. So I think that uh, these horses did not find rescues or retirements or shelters. I think these horses were processed for meat, and they were removed from the population, 
and then uh, the industry kind of rebounded and uh, started growing again. Uh, it's also interesting when we look at unwanted uh, horses and we talk, start talking about what are we going to do about it, how are we going to manage these horses. If you look at slaughter versus death or euthanasia, again, there are around 112,000 horses a year, which is about 1.24% of the horse population. Figuring at the horse population, the American Horse Council estimates there's about 9 million horses in this country today. So that represents about 1.2%. According to a study run by the uh, USDA National Animal Health Monitoring System in 2005, about 1.8 percent of the population, horse population, between the age of 30 days of age and older dies each year or euthanized each year. So the total mortality is somewhere around 3 percent, give or take a few. They also ran a survey back in 1998 and it's almost identical, so there really hasn't been a change in the uh, mortality rate in horses. When you look at the economic impact of euthanizing and carcass disposal uh, versus rescuing these horses, because rescuing these unwanted horses is a really a big issue. Uh, we know that there are about, oh gosh, 500 rescue facilities in the United States that are tax-free. Uh, which are, there are what, 503 C's, I think they call them, where uh, they're a true uh, charity. And if you donate money to them, uh, it can be uh, deducted from your taxes. And so there are roughly about 500 of those that we're aware of. Now, one of the problems with rescue facilities is they don't have a national organization. So it's very difficult to figure out exactly how many there are. But we can calculate that there are at least 500 of these that are tax exempt. They estimate that they can rescue about 15,000 horses a year. If you look at the cost of euthanasia and carcass disposal, most veterinarians charge between $60 and $150 a euthanize a horse, and the carcass disposal costs are around $186 per head. So if you had an unwanted horse and you euthanized it, yeah, we, the, we would spend roughly $18 million, give or take a little bit a year. If we were to rescue all of those horses. A study done by Dr. North for the annual World Food and Agribusiness Forum in 2004, he calculated that it costs around $2,300 to feed a horse for a year. American Association of Equine Practitioners estimated it costs around $1,850 to feed a horse for a year, and that's not counting veterinary or farrier care. So if we were to rescue all of these 100,000 horses, we would spend somewhere between 187 to $234 million per year. And this is a big problem, a big issue in the unwanted horse discussion because where does all this money come from? And there's a lot of debate whether it should come from the animal owner, from charities, from the breed associations, or from the federal government, and no one's really come to a consensus or conclusion yet. So what are some of the options for unwanted horses? Well, the best option is a change of occupation. <clears throat> it used to be that thoroughbreds that couldn't run fast enough made good three-day event or hunter-jumper horses, and they still do. But I think the warm bloods have replaced them in a lot of those events because they have the speed and the athleticism of the thoroughbred, but they have a lot quieter disposition. There are rescue retirement facilities in almost every state, and we talked a little about that. They can rescue these horses. You can put them up for adoption, which is what the Bureau of Land Management does, and also there are other organizations around the country that put horses up for adoption. Uh, they can be donated to a teaching hospital or a veterinary hospital for research, and, uh, and that's done, although it's relatively limited. There's some donation to therapeutic riding programs or police academies or police forces. They can be euthanized at a processing plant and the meat used for human consumption. They can be euthanized at the owner's request, or they can be abandoned and neglected and abused. And so uh, those are the main options that are available today, and we're going to talk about them a lot more here in a little bit. 
So let's talk about euthanasia, and this isn't a very pleasant subject, and, and I apologize up front because it's going to be relatively blunt and to the point, but that's kind of the way euthanasia is. I think euthanasia of a horse is one of the most difficult decisions that any horse owner has to make, and it's usually avoided until it has to be made, which means you have a terminal colic or your horse with a fractured leg or you have an old horse that uh, it's in the middle of the winter and that horse can't get up because it's too old and too weak. And then the owner and the veterinarian have to sit and discuss what they're going to do and come to a decision. The term euthanasia is derived from the Greek term eu meaning good and thanatos meaning death. And a good death occurs with minimum pain and at a time in the horse's life that prevents unnecessary pain and suffering. Our responsibility as veterinarians is to help the owners make the decision because it's frequently very, very difficult, especially if they've had the horse for years. It's to pre prepare them for what's going to happen and how the horse responds. And depending on the type of euthanasia method you use, there are different responses. And then, our, of course, our final thing is to make sure that we end the horse's life as painlessly and distress-free as possible. Horses are much more difficult to euthanize than small animals because if you euthanize a dog and they're up on the examination table and you give them a, a shot, a barbiturate, they'll lower their head and go to sleep. But horses usually are standing and they crash to the ground. And it's always traumatic for the owner or anybody else that's involved, especially if they don't know what's going to happen or, or don't expect what's going to happen. So traditionally, we have based euthanasia of horses only on medical assessment criteria, which would be whatever the condition that their experience is hopeless, that the, it causes unnecessary pain and suffering, or the horse is a hazard to itself or its handlers or it's going to require medication for the rest of his life in order to keep it pain-free. But I think, and we are discussing this quite a lot in almost all the horse breeds and in the coalition, the day is coming, I suspect, where we're going to have to discuss euthanizing horses that we no longer want. That's occurred, it happened in the dog and cat industry for years. I mean, 35 years ago when I graduated from veterinary college, unwanted pets were a big problem and, and uh, millions of them are being euthanized each year. And here we are 35 years later, and we still euthanize somewhere around 8 to 10 million dogs and cats in this country. The question I have here is how do you stand the use of a gun to euthanize a horse? And we're going to talk about that, so hang on a couple seconds, and I'll tell you what I think. So there are three acceptable method, uh, methods that we can use to euthanize horses. And these three methods are accepted by the American Veterinary Medical Association, which in 2000 put together a panel of experts to discuss what is proper a proper euthanasia procedure for all species of animals. And in the horse, uh, there was agreement that this uh, barbiturate overdose, which is an injectable anesthetic, gunshot, and penetrating cafty bolts are acceptable. And we're going to talk about each one of those in detail. So the advantage of a barbiturate overdose is that death occurs rapidly within minutes uh, with minimal discomfort to the horse because about the only thing the horse feels is the injection, is the needle stick. With If, if done properly, they shouldn't feel much at all. Now, some veterinarians will argue, and, and, and I've seen this myself, that uh, there is a few seconds up to a minute maybe where the drug starts to affect the horse, and you can see, uh, you can see a look of bewilderment in the horse's eyes and maybe even fear if you're pretty good at reading body language because all of a sudden they can feel that something's happening, and horses have a strong uh, instinct to stay on their feet, and they can see that they're losing it. But that passes fairly rapidly, and then the horse goes down. The disadvantages is that it's DEA controlled, and so we have to keep strict records. We have to keep it locked up in a safe, and uh, we have to report it to the federal government. And so it's a drug that's difficult to maintain. It has to be given intravenously. It can't be given in a muscle. And so there are situations where it's difficult to restrain a horse where you can actually give it. I've been involved in trailer accidents where horses were down in a trailer and thrashing and violent, and it was too dangerous to crawl in next to them and administer it. You have to give it rapidly 
and in sufficient quantity. And the average 1,100 pound horse will take about 100 cc's. This liquid is kind of syrupy and thick, and so you have to use a large needle, like a 14 gauge or bigger, and you have to give it quickly. And where people get in trouble is where they get part of it in, and then they the horse moves or they lose a vein or the horse goes down before they get all of it in and the horse starts to struggle and uh, those are really those are really unpleasant also the carcass is an environmental hazard if a wild animal or a carnivore like your dog were to eat the carcass it would cause them at least to go to sleep for a long period of time or worse uh, kill them and there have been reported cases of wildlife uh, dying that have consumed horse carcasses or cattle carcasses or sheep carcasses that have been euthanized with a barbiturate. And so uh, that's that's becoming more and more of a problem. It used to be, and we'll talk about carcass disposal here in a little bit, but uh, it used to be that uh, you could take carcasses to a landfill, and today some of them will not accept them if they've been euthanized with barbiturate overdose. And the other thing, and this is what you really have to prepare the owner for, is sometimes after these horses go down, they will vocalize, they'll nicker, they will take a breath periodically. Even though it's been several minutes since the drug was administered, they may paddle, they may move their head. And these horses are unconscious because the drug first causes them to become unconscious, then it causes their respiration to stop, and then it causes their heart to stop in a pretty rapid succession. And so oftentimes the owner watching that thinks the horse is suffering or it is awake and can, uh, is aware of what's going on, but they're not. But again, you have to prepare the owner for that because if you don't, they're going to be really upset or horrified. And so it's incumbent upon the veterinarian to explain all of this. What's not allowed is neuromuscular agents like succinylcholine or strychnine or caffeine or any number of different things. And one of the things I encourage uh, veterinarians, especially young veterinarians, uh, to help this is to put an IV catheter in this horse because an IV catheter uh, will not come out. You won't lose the catheter. It, it's going to stay in there, even if the horse moves. And so the risk of losing the vein uh, is minimized. There's some discussion. Some veterinarians like to sedate the horses first so that everything's calmer and easier. I personally don't because I think when you sedate the horse, you slow down their respiration, you slow down their heart rate, you slow down everything, and you prolong uh, the period from when you give the injection until the horse is unconscious and they may even stumble a bit and struggle a little bit more. We have the same problem with old horses. A lot of old horses have a really poor cardiovascular system and when you inject them you'll step back and most horses within a minute you'll have some effect and those old horses may stand there and look at you for two or three minutes and then about the time you think that you miss the vein uh, they go they fall over so uh, I'm not much of a fan of using sedatives but I certainly understand veterinarians that do. Gunshot the advantage is that it, you cause immediate unconsciousness and death immediately uh, it doesn't require restraint and that you don't have to hold the head still uh, the carcass is not an environmental hazard and, uh, but the, the disadvantages are it requires some skill and experience with a gun, and it may be displeasing to owners. Honestly, in response to John's question, when I euthanize my own horses, I use gunshot because there is absolutely no pain. It's immediate, and uh, they're, they're immediately unconscious and dead, and I think it's the most humane form of euthanasia. But I can tell you, in 35 years of practicing, uh, I haven't used a gunshot on more than two or three client horses. They just, the uh, clients just uh, have a lot of problem with that. And uh, they don't want you to do it. Uh, it requires a relatively large gun, at least a 22 Magnum or larger impact. And, and I think that when people get in trouble, I always have this issue with policemen that have to euthanize a horse is that they tend to want to shoot them at between the eyes which all you'll do there is hit their frontal sinus and cause them to have a bloody nose the point of impact is if you draw a cross between the ears and the eyes is at that impact point and uh, that will hit the brain and cause immediate death 
from a side view, you aim down through the brain stem. And again, these aren't very pleasant discussions, but I think it's important to completely understand the issue. Captive bolt, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of resistance to captive bolt, but quite honestly, captive bolt is exactly like a gunshot if done properly. Uh, it penetrates the skull. Death and unconsciousness is immediate. The carcass is not an environmental hazard. The disadvantage is that you have to restrain the horse because you have to hold the captive bolt against their forehead firmly. And it may be displeasing to observers just like gunshot. This is a captive bolt that we use traditionally. Uh, when you fly horses on an airplane, whoever flies with them has to have one of these in case something happens. Uh, this is the type that's used in a processing plant where they're not restraining the horse's head, but they have a four-foot handle so they can apply it uh, without restraining the horse's head. There's some discussion about, and you'll hear that there's a difference between a horse's skull and a cow's skull, and therefore you can't use captive bolt or gunshot on a horse's skull, but a cow, which is where it's commonly used, has a much thicker skull, on, and you can see this is a horse's brain, and the skull is relatively thin, and so there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't. And that's what they use in processing plants. Most processing plants in America use captive bolt. I think in Canada, they use captive bolt and gunshot, but again, they're, they're really the same thing. Carcass disposal has to be done in a safe manner. It's a big issue and a big problem that we're discussing, not only in unwanted horses, but also across uh, agriculture. The veterinarians are legally responsible for the carcass to, uh, the, that is disposed of in a proper manner, although I don't think many of them realize that. And when I give talks to veterinarians, they're always surprised, but they are. There's a wide variation of regulations. The AEP did a survey where we asked uh, most of the states what their regulations were for carcass disposal, and they vary from state to state, from county to county, and from city to city, and so there really is no set standard for carcass disposal anywhere. You have to really check with the local authorities. There are several options. We're going to go through each one fairly rapidly. You can bury them in some states. I live where I live, uh, south of Kansas City. We cannot bury a carcass on our farm, but we can drag it off back in the timber and let the animals eat it. Uh, but most states will allow that. Uh, landfills, of course, rendering plants, cremation, composting, biodigestion, which you may not know about, and then of course processing and removing the carcass for meat. Burial varies with the state. Generally, the carcass has to be covered with three or four foot of dirt. In Texas, you have to put lime over the carcass. They usually have to be at least 100 yards away from a well or a stream. And the cost, of course, is dependent on backhoe cost, and that can vary from 250 to $500 or more. Landfills, some will not accept chemically euthanized horses. Some will not accept horses at all or any carcass. Uh, the price, again, varies based on the landfill. Rendering plants. A rendering plant cooks the carcass to destroy all the bacteria and viruses, and then they convert it into fertilizers or animal feed, prim primarily uh, bone meal or blood meal. Uh, it's available, they're available only about half the states, and primarily they're around agricultural states, especially if they're large dairies or swine or poultry production facilities where there are a lot of animal deaths. Uh, but we, but again, the, the numbers decrease every year, and I'm not sure how long they'll be around. When I was a kid, when they came out and picked up one of our horses or cows, they would pay us by leaving tankage for us to mix in our feed, and then uh, they got where they wouldn't do that, they would just pick them up for free, and now they charge to pick them up, and again, that varies from as low as $75 to up to $250. I have a note here that says, is there a rending plant in Central North Carolina, I guess, and I would think there would be something there because uh, of the swine production facilities, but honestly, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, cremation, incineration is the crematoriums are regulated by the U.S. or the EPA. I'm sorry, by EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. The cost varies with the price of propane, and so it can be anywhere from 600 to 2,000 dollars. A few years ago, I had a 
unfortunate enough to have a barn fire. One of my clients had killed about 10 horses, and uh, one of my clients that sold his horses there decided to have his three horses cremated, and it cost him uh, right at $900 a horse to have that done. So it's relatively expensive. Composting, I think, is probably the up-and-coming thing. Um, there's research being done at Texas A&M and at several other universities around the country where they're looking at composting and they can compost a complete horse carcass if uh, and it, it, it's based on how often you turn the compost but you can use nothing more than uh, stall shavings and manure uh, combined with water they put two or three feet of, of shavings underneath the carcass they cover it with two or three feet of shavings and wet it down and then turn it periodically and they can completely compost a carcass in about 10 weeks. If you don't turn them frequently, uh, it, it takes sometimes up to eight or nine months. But even at that, that's pretty good. And, and I think that we're going to, we're seeing a lot of research done on that. And I think uh, the future, we're going to see a lot more composting because it's environmentally uh, safe and, and it's a good way to handle carcasses. Because carcass disposal is a big issue. If we get to the point, which there's a lot of discussion, that some of the rescue retirement or even some of the uh, states are talking about setting up uh, centers where you can bring a horse that you no longer want and they will euthanize it and uh, dispose of the carcass and composting is probably the way to do that. So question, how are all the dead downer cows and yos disposed of? Most of them go into rendering plants. If there's a rendering plant nearby, or otherwise I think a lot of them are buried on the farm. But most of them, especially in dairies, go to rendering plants. Would the composting be done at a facility on the owner's property? Well, there are composting facilities being set up, uh, but you can do it on your own property. There's a uh, study that was done at uh, Texas A&M in Amarillo, Texas, where they took four uh, or six big round bales. They put one along the end and two on each side and they put down three or four feet of bedding. They put the horse carcass on top of it. They put three or four feet over that, watered it down and left it and it composted the horse in around six or seven months. So you could do it at your own place. Um, of course you'd lose the, the big round bales would uh, compost along with it I expect over time but you could certainly do it. Biodigesters are not commonly found around the country. They're primarily found at universities, veterinary colleges, and places where they're doing research. And what they do, there's a picture of it there. They, they pressure cook the carcass and actually turn it into powder and a liquid. And you end up with a uh, bones like this, but these bones are soft. And if you pick them up, you can smash them into a powder. And uh, and it's really a very efficient way. But again, these these things cost about a million dollars, and so they're not readily available. But the cost depends on whether or not you want the bones back, or it would be like getting ashes back. And so uh, it's only a couple hundred dollars if they're put into the deal with a lot of other animal carcasses. If you specifically want your horse back, then it's up around eleven, twelve hundred dollars. So those are the main ways that we can dispose of carcasses and it's a big issue that we need to think about and talk about and I'm going to very very quickly go through the federal slaughter legislation because you cannot talk about unwanted horses without talking about this and the unwanted horse coalition is completely neutral on this subject and so I'm not going to get into whether it's a good thing or a bad thing I'm just going to tell you about it then you can decide but the first Federal bills that, that were uh, aimed at prohibiting the interstate transport of horses slaughter were introduced in the Congress in 2001 by Congressman Morella out of New York, and none of them passed, but it fired up a lot of discussion. In 2002, the American Association of Equine Practitioners surveyed their membership because I was the chair of the Welfare Committee and, and I was going to become president within a year. and. Uh, we needed to discuss this with our membership to see what they thought about it. So we discussed it and uh, we found that of the 8,000 AEP members, about 78% of them 
felt that slaughter was a necessary aspect of the horse industry because it was a viable way to remove unwanted horses. 85% were opposed to the legislation, not necessarily because they were opposed to outlawing horse slaughter, but there were things in the legislation they didn't like. And uh, the focus of AEP is animal welfare, and, and so we don't, uh, you know, we didn't get too deep into the deal. And they also felt that whether you eat horse meat or not is a society issue. It's not up to the veterinarians to decide. Our concern was what happens to the horse up into the point of death and how is it euthanized. And after that, it's up to society how they view uh, eating horses. But the problems within the industry in the Quarter Horse Association, American Veterinary Medical Association, National Cattlemen's Beef, and several other the problem that we had with the with the legislation was that there was no infrastructure to address the welfare of horses that couldn't be removed from the population because of processing. There was nothing in it to address carcass disposal. They didn't provide an enforcement plan or an agency to oversee it, and it didn't provide funding for unwanted horses. In 1999, the state of California passed a law that says you can't transport a horse from the state of California for slaughter and human consumption. And when you talk to those folks, they tell you, you know, you say, so how's that going? Fine. Has anybody been prosecuted? No. Is there anybody enforcing it? No. And uh, so we felt that if we're going to take that step, they at least need to take these measures to make sure that it's meaningful. So that bill did not pass in 2003, 2005, through 2005 it was reintroduced with nothing. In 2006 the American Horse Slaughter Prevention Act was passed by the House, which is different, but not considered by the Senate. And in 2007, uh, H.R. 503, which has been, what's been introduced, was introduced in the House and S311 was introduced in the Senate and nothing's happened. And I don't think anything's going to happen. Uh, because the election year and also, and we'll talk about here in a minute, the states, Texas and Illinois, where they were processing plants, have taken action to close them, so they're closed anyhow. So, we were asked, AAP as veterinarians, we were asked, what do you think about horse processing? Do you think the horses are treated humanely, and do you think they're euthanized properly? And so we went down, there are four or five of us in the leadership of the association. There are two federal USDA veterinarians, these are pictures of them, that were on site inspecting the horses. There were Texas Southwest Cattle Razor inspectors on hand to do the brand inspections and to check to make sure none of the horses were stolen. And our feeling was these horses were being treated very well. Now, processing plants are not nice places to be, and I've been to horse, cattle, pig, and chicken, and they're all unpleasant places. But these horses were treated calmly. They had food and water. They moved through the uh, facilities quietly. They were euthanized with captive bolt humanely. They were not frightened. They were not terrorized. They were not screaming uh, and doing a lot of the things that people imagine they would be. They were very calm. And then the inspectors inspected the uh, skulls to make sure they were being euthanized properly. And I watched them euthanize about 50 horses, and they were extremely accurate, and the horses were immediately unconscious. Uh, something I think people also need to be aware is that the transport of horses to slaughter is regulated by the federal government. And the 1996 Farm Bill gave them that responsibility, and, and that bill is to ensure that horses are fit to travel, that they're provided food and water prior to loading, that they have plenty of floor space, that aggressive horses are segregated, and then they have a tag, and you'll see a picture later on in my presentation. They put a green tag on these horses with a number, and then that follows them with a certificate so that at the plant, the federal veterinarians can track how long those horses were on the road, where they came from, and so forth. The regulations don't allow horses that are unable to bear weight on all four legs, that can't walk unassisted, they'd be like a downer cow, blind in both eyes, or a foal under six months of age, or a pregnant mare near foaling. I, the horses that I saw at the plants and the horses I saw on the Mexican border, I, I've never seen a foal. I've never seen anything probably younger than uh, two or three, and I've never seen a mare that appeared pregnant. 
Also in 2006, the double-decker trailers were outlawed, and so they can no longer be used. And they were a problem because I don't know how familiar you all are with them, but when you load these horses in the back of a double-decker or pot or possum belly, it's what they call them, the horse has to go up a ramp or down a ramp, and if a horse has not been in and out of one of those trailers several times, they balk at that, and they will jump, and they often cut their forehead or injure themselves, and so uh, phasing those out was really a good thing. The plants that were, there were two plants in Texas and one plant in uh, Illinois. The plant in Texas the Humane Society of the United States found a 1949 Texas law that prohibited the slaughter of horses for human consumption, and they brought that up to the Texas courts, and uh, they enacted the law, enforced the law, and closed the plant. In Illinois, there was an Illinois bill passed that amended the Illinois Horse Meat Act that made it unlawful to slaughter a horse if the portion knows that they're going to be used for human consumption. And so for all practical purposes, all of the plants are closed in this country. Here's a chart that shows U.S. processing numbers, and the point I'm wanting to make here is if you look in blue, these are the number, and I know you probably can't read this, these are the number of horses that were processed for meat from 2001 to 2006, and you can see the, the numbers up here. There's always been a consistent number, 20 to 35,000, that go to Canada. But starting in, 19, in 2004, we started to see horses go to Mexico. And in 2007, there were at least 45,000 horses that were exported to Mexico. We know that in Canada, the Canadian regulations for handling horses and euthanasia are the same as ours, and they're enforced strictly. Mexico, we, we really don't know, and we've made some efforts to go down there. And this chart just shows you we, we have always uh, exported horses for riding or for breeding to Mexico, and that stays pretty flat. But look at here, if we start from 1999, and as the plants in this country closed, boom, the number of horses exported to Mexico. So we're fairly concerned about that because we, we know that when I talk to the federal veterinarians in Mexico, they assure me that they follow the same regulations as we do here and that you have to use captive bolt or gunshot. We know the European plants follow the same regulations but we're not so sure that they're enforced as well in the Mexico plant. This is just a chart that shows you uh, and presses the point that there's been a dramatic increase. But what I find interesting is the number of stallions, mares, and gildings has increased. And one of the discussion points, the humane groups are pushing pretty hard to outlaw the transport of horses to Mexico for slaughter. But I hear from talking to people that are involved in that business that uh, when you send a horse to Mexico or Canada for slaughter, that horse does not have to have a negative Coggins test and does not have to have a health certificate. All they have to have is a USDA transport to slaughter certificate and back tag. If you want to export a horse to Canada or Mexico or anywhere else in the world, you have to have an international health certificate and a negative Coggins. And the people in this business tell me that if they can no longer ship these horses for slaughter, they will just draw Coggins and, and get international health certificates and ship them over as riders or breeding animals. And, and once they cross the border, then they're out of our control and what happens, happens. There are three kinds of plants in Mexico. One's a TIF plant that provides meat to Europe. And they are strictly inspected and use captive bolt, and I believe that. We've tried to get down and inspect those plants, but we've had a little trouble getting permission from the Mexican government. There are municipal plants that are government-owned, and then there are clandestine plants that are privately owned and not regulated, and I think that therein lies the problem. Now, we know the horses crossing, going to the TIF plants, cross the border in a sealed trailer, are, are are moved into another seal trailer and go on to the plant. So we know they're not sold to the private plants, but uh, horses that cross uh, any other way may be. This is just some pictures of horses at the pl at the border, and this is the green USDA transport to slaughter tag I was telling you about. They used to. 
to uh, track the horses. You can look at this horse. You can see he's had a broken knee at some point in his life. But if you look out across these horses, and again, these aren't big pictures, you can see they just look like they just look like horses. Clandestine. Question: What's clandestine? Clandestine, I guess, means illegal. There are little local mom and pop horse slaughter plants in uh, little towns in Mexico that nobody knows about. So anyhow, the federal legislation, the American Association of Equine Practitioners believes that horse processing is not really the issue here. The issue here is that there are a large number of unwanted horses that are being discarded, and like I said earlier, they end up at a processing plant because they're inexpensive and they have little value. And so the AEP has done several things. It's put together a handbook on unwanted horses that talks about care and handling guidelines at rescue facilities. There's been a lot of discussion you know, within the Veterinary Association, the veterinary industry about this. And I had a question where you discussed the real issue, which is overbreeding. We'll discuss that here in a little bit, too. And the AEP has kind of taken the lead in talking to the horse industry about the issue and trying to come to some resolution. But in 2005, we hosted a summit where we brought a large number of horse industry groups in to Washington, D.C. because we thought there was an unwanted horse problem and we wanted to know if the rest of the horse industry felt that way. And if they did, if perhaps they would join us in trying to do something about it. And so you can see here we have Marin Quarter Horse, the Paint Horse, the ASPCA, we have the Humane Society of the United States, the Hoofed Animal Humane Society, Days In is a rescue facility, uh, NAERIC are the PMU farms, uh, the Jockey Club, which is the breed uh, registry for the thoroughbred industry. So we had a pretty good cross section of the horse industry and, and we brought them in and we asked them, do you think there's an unwanted horse problem? Do you think any segment of the industry has accepted responsibility for that? And I can tell you the answer to that at that point was no. Is the problem a surplus caused by overbreeding or overproduction? What's responsible horse ownership? Will federal legislation help or hurt? And the big question was, can the horse industry equine welfare groups, equine veterinarians, and the government come together to solve the problem. Because I can tell you that there is a lot of conflict between many horse groups, humane groups, the government. I mean, these are groups that don't traditionally get along well. And so here were the conclusions. Most of the industry agreed there was an unwanted horse problem, but they didn't think that the average horse owner knew anything about it. And I think that was really true. Now that's changed quite a bit. There was a survey run by the Colorado, Colorado Horse, uh, uh, their State Horse Association, about three months ago. And that survey showed that 91% of the people surveyed knew there was an unwanted horse problem and had a pretty strong opinion about what caused it. And that's a real change from this meeting in 2005. So there is some progress being made. We also know that the current rescue retirement facilities cannot accommodate all the horses that have become unwanted each year. We also believe that the entire industry has to do something about it. This just isn't a Western horse problem or a thoroughbred problem or a PMU farm problem. There's not a large funding source, definitely not a large government funding source. And there is a real need for pre-ownership education because I know if you all are in the horse business, you've seen the person that decides they want a horse, they find a trainer, they go buy a horse, and their expectations are much different than the reality and they end up unhappy and dumping the horse. And that responsible ownership is the key. And responsible ownership includes taking care of the horse and at some point in time perhaps uh, perhaps dealing with uh, end of life. I have a comment here. Unfortunately, the Colorado Survey was a self-selected survey rather than scientific random survey. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. The survey was uh, sent out to primarily horse groups. About a third of the people surveyed were provided uh, were not horse owners. Uh, it was self-selected in that the uh, 
Colorado Veterinary Medical Association, most of the Colorado breeds the survey was sent to. Around 2,000 people responded. You're right, it was not uh, random, and it was not, and it was on the Internet. That's true. But I still think that it's a pretty good indication that there's a lot more awareness of this problem out there than there was two or three years ago. I've been giving talks on this issue since uh, 2001, and I can tell you that four or five years ago, if I used the term unwanted horse, I had to go to great lengths to explain exactly what that is. And today, we see that term used everywhere. So I think that there, there is more awareness. Now, it may not be 100%, but I think we've made great strides. So let's see, mission statement. So, so anyhow, and I'll get, there's a couple questions here I'll try to get to in a minute. Well, let me do it right now. That's an interesting question. What if you have two horses to push around, a loner and an older one? Is that neglect or is that being an irresponsible horse owner? Well, I think if you have dominant horses and they're pushing old horses or timid horses off the feed bunk, and therefore the other horses suffer because they don't get enough feed, or they're injured because they're kicked and abused, yeah, I think that's irresponsible horse ownership. They should uh, find a way to provide for those horses separately. That's my personal opinion. So anyhow, at the conclusion of this, we formed the Unwanted Horse Coalition. And the mission of that coalition is to reduce the number of unwanted horses and improve their welfare through education and the efforts of organizations committed to the health, safety, and responsible care of horses. We moved it under the American Horse Council, which is a national organization in Washington, D.C., because there were members of the coalition that had strong opinion on both sides of the horse slaughter legislation issue, and we wanted to take that off the table. So we moved it under a neutral uh, body. We don't talk about the legislation much, and we're focused completely on education and increasing awareness and responsible ownership. So I know this is really small, but it shows you the current membership of the coalition. It started with about 10 members, and now we're up to well over 20, and, and we have people or organizations join weekly. And you can see the primary veterinary groups are primarily breed associations. There are some uh, rescue facilities. The American Humane Association joined here a few weeks ago, which was good. And so those are the main groups. And they, they primarily represent the horse industry. We'd like to see a few more rescue retirement groups join. But honestly, they, they have to put up some money because this is completely funded by the membership. And most of them would rather put the money toward rescuing horses than uh, belonging to this. And we understand that. So the goals, the primary goal is to raise awareness of the issue. And again, we continue to do that. And uh, we're doing that here tonight. Here's a question. Are you going to be at the talk in D.C. in June? Are you talking about the uh, USDA meeting? Or are you talking about the American Horse Council meeting? You can, you can comment and I'll come back to you. Educate owners, both. Yeah, I'll be at both of them. I'm, I'm giving a talk at the USDA meeting. Uh, our goal is to raise awareness, to educate horse owners on responsible care, to educate potential owners to exchange information on adoption and alternative careers and provide information on life-ending decisions. And so we've developed a number of pamphlets and a number of brochures that we've distributed around the horse industry. And you can go on this website, the unwantedhorsecoalition.org, and access these, or you can contact them, and they'll send these to you. And they're primarily discussing uh, the issue and what the alternatives. Here's a question. What about the PMU industry constantly exposing mares yet they're losing land? It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure what that means, exposing mares. Uh, we'll clarify that a little bit and we'll answer it. But anyhow, you can go on this website and you can see uh, some of the pamphlets. There's a booklet that has rescue guidelines and so forth. There's really a good booklet that shows the different alternatives for horses that are unwanted, but also provides you 
with questions. If you were going to take your horse to a rescue, questions that you should ask them to ensure that they're actually going to take care of your horse and not turn around tomorrow and ship it somewhere are, you have to be aware that there are people in the industry we call hoarders or collectors, and we have that in every animal species. And these are people that are well-intentioned, but they take in animals and then they don't have the ability to take care of them. And in the end, most of these animals are worse off. And so there's some really good information in there that will help you if you have a horse that you want to donate to a rescue or donate somewhere, what questions you should ask. There have been a lot of headlines in the news lately about hungry horses and neglect and, and abuse and rescue problems, and I think that reflects not only the horses that traditionally have gone to processing plants, but it reflects the high price of diesel and gas and the higher price of grain and uh, and also, we've had some droughts in the in the southeast that's caused the price of hay to go up through the ceiling. And so it's really having a dramatic effect on the lower end of the horse industry. Here's a question. Does the Unwanted Horse Coalition provide direct care for horses? And the answer is no. If you go on the website, what you'll find is there's a list of around 140 or 50 rescue facilities that we believe are, are good viable facilities that do provide that and uh, and you can certainly go on there and get get that list so here are the conclusions or my conclusions here's what i think we will never completely eliminate it eliminate unwanted horses because we are always going to have horses that get older and you know a 25 or 35 year old horse today is not uncommon. I have a horse that's 31 that looks like he's about 20 and I have no doubt he'll live to be 40 because he's extremely healthy. We're always going to have horses that are injured or poor athletes or not good enough. You could be the best horse in the world to the best mare and, and you often will come up with a horse that doesn't meet your needs and so we're always going to have this problem but I think that we can minimize it a lot of ways there's always a question, are we breeding too many horses? And maybe we are, maybe we're not. But I always recommend to people that when you think about buying a horse, perhaps you ought to breed one, or you're thinking about breeding your horse, perhaps you ought to buy one instead. I mean, I've heard of hundreds of people in my life say, I'm going to breed old, what's her name, old Dobbin, and see what I get. And my question to them is always, well, if you don't get what you want, what are you going to do with the foal? Or I hear people say, we're going to breed our mares so the kids have the experience of seeing a foal-born, which I think is really poor, because what are they going to do with that horse then? You might consider adopting rather than buying, and one discussion in the breed associations is that, you know, in the dog breed associations, if you want a golden retriever, there's a, there are golden retriever rescues around the country that you can go adopt one rather than buy one, and, and the quarter horse people are talking about this, and I know other breeds are too, that perhaps they'll set up a website where people want to donate a horse, and you can go on there and select one and adopt it. Alternative careers, we need to continue doing that. This picture of this horse right here is a PMU foal that was out of a draft mare to PMU farm that my wife adopted. He's an outstanding horse. He cost almost nothing. And, uh, and he's a great horse, a good athlete and a really good horse. Or you can also consider euthanizing rather than discarding or getting rid of a horse. I've got several questions. We'll get to these here in a second. So what can you do? I think it's important that you learn the facts. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think that it's incumbent upon us in the horse industry to get the facts and to share that with other horse owners within our breed or clubs or breed associations to non-horse owners because, honestly, the non-horse owning public pushes most of the legislation and controls this much more than the horse owners do. Consider establishing breed-specific rescue adoption programs. Own responsibly. Each of us need to do this ourselves. Be aware of how our actions affect the welfare of our horses. Pause and consider the consequences before you breed or buy a horse. I mean, if it doesn't work out, what are you going to do about it? And I think we have to take responsibility for horses after we no longer want them. I know my horses, when they get too old, 
they uh, are not sent to a sale barn and unloaded and I drive off, I euthanize them. And I think uh, we ought to think about that. Okay, so let me run back here and see some of these questions. Do you think the slaughter laws will change in near future? Prices are up, prices are up, and the economy is going down. I don't think that the slaughter laws will change. There's quite a bit of activity in Washington, D.C. about this issue, but honestly, these plants were closed by the states, not by the federal government. And so if any action is taken, it will have to be taken at the state. I do know that the plant in uh, Illinois has appealed to the Supreme Court that uh, the state of Illinois doesn't have the right to close a uh, company that functions internationally. And, and what I hear is the Supreme Court may very well hear that uh, argument. Here's a question. There's no such thing as an unattractive horse, uh, my friends say. Well, that's true. I guess. Depends how you look at it. Uh, okay, here's the question on the PMU. Is the PMU industry slowing down the production or reproduction of so many horses? Yeah, you know, five years ago, the, and, uh, and I don't know if you're all aware of the PMU, the PMU industry is an industry that collects urine from pregnant mares and then uses that to produce estrogen to give uh, to women in menopause. They have reduced the number of PMU horses in Canada and the United States from a high of 40,000 four or five years ago. There were 40,000 mares on the line to down less than uh, 5,000. Now, the other thing they've done, and this is why my wife owns one, is it used to be that the foals were a byproduct because they really didn't have any need for the foals. And so these foals, a lot of them end up in feedlots and going to processing plants. But what they started doing three or four years ago, or maybe a little longer, they started breeding these mares. Most of these mares are draft cross or draft mares. They started breeding them to warm blood and thoroughbred stallions and produce what they call a Canadian sport horse because 90%, 95% of these PMU farms are in Canada. And so what they produce today is a tall, athletic horse that's being sold into the hunter jumper dressage uh, three-day event market. And, and I've been up to the PMU farms and these are really nice foals really nice young horses and they're not especially expensive I think they sell these horses for under a thousand dollars a piece and the, the one my wife has he's a two-year-old we just started breaking him uh, he's 16 3 right now and I'm sure he'll be well over 17 and a great mover and a nice horse so they have done a lot to help that straighten out that situation they also have uh, the organization that oversees all the farm has started a uh, added money uh, contest that they have where they show the offsprings and so there's a lot of incentive by those farms to produce really good foals now and what they're finding now is they're making more money from the foals than they are from the urine okay what's the cost of a rescue organization joining the unwanted horse coalition the unwanted horse coalition it depends on wh how involved you want to be the large groups like the quarter horse association and the jockey club and uh, american association of equine practitioners they pay around five thousand dollars for an annual membership but you can pay down as low as you want to go it depends how active if you want to be on the uh, oversight committee most of those are paying five thousand dollars if you want to just be involved in the organization and perhaps serve on some of the committees I think those people pay a thousand dollars or down and I'm sure that they'd be happy to uh, take any donations or anything you'd like to donate okay so how do I get your email address it is uh, horse h-o-r-s-e-t-r-l at aol.com so I'm getting the nod that I need to wrap this up. Thanks to everybody. I hope I provided plenty of good information for you all, and, uh, and uh, good luck. Thanks, Dr. Lentz, for tonight's live web presentation.
If you have questions in regards to this presentation or any future presentations, please visit myhorseuniversity.com. You can also email us at info at myhorseuniversity.com as well. Thank you all for attending and have a great night.